The anime begins with a scene where a flower is touched by a drop of blood. Following this, the camera moves towards some people whose eyes we cannot see, but they do indeed have eyes because they are witnessing something extraordinary. They are not the only ones observing this event, as a small crow approaches to witness it as well, as if nature itself recognizes that what is happening is not normal. Next, we see a sword that appears to be very sharp pressing against someone's neck. However, despite the wielder applying a lot of pressure, the weapon cannot penetrate the neck. It is then explained that death by beheading is very complex because the person responsible must be a master swordsman. The neck consists of structures that make it difficult to cut through easily. Then we see a white-haired man kneeling on the ground waiting for the executioner to finish, and in front of them, we can see a fat man. For those wondering, that's not me, so I'll stop making jokes. I suspect he is a shogun, watching everything with his round face. The executioner then tries to behead Gabamaru again and asks for his last words. Gabamaru responds that he has nothing to say. After that, the executioner attempts to carry out his task, but he cannot because, for some reason, the sword cannot penetrate the neck. Amid all this, we learn that cutting off a head in one stroke is one of the most difficult things to do, and this is evident because the executioner before us cannot accomplish it. As a result, the man becomes impatient and starts cutting more aggressively, but still to no avail. During this event, we continue to learn about the intricacies of beheading. It is explained that usually, executioners cannot cut something in one stroke, which is why the places where such things happen are always messy. This makes us wonder why the flower was stained with blood even though Gabamaru did not receive any injuries. If you have that question, my answer is that we are watching an anime, so don't expect too much logic. Besides, the flower does look epic. In short, in the end, the executioner cannot behead Gabamaru because the sword breaks instead. As expected, the fat man is shocked by this event because he wanted to be entertained, while Gabamaru sighs in exhaustion, realizing that nothing can kill him. Then the executioner is terrified because he cannot believe what has happened. In the midst of this, we see the face of the white-haired man, whom we now know as Gabamaru. He then asks why he cannot die, or more precisely, why he cannot be killed. Until this point, the series has not told us this character's name, so I have not mentioned it. The story follows Gabamaru, who remains distressed because he cannot end his life for some mystical reason. While reflecting on this, we realize that he has no attachment to life because his hands are stained with the blood of hundreds of people. It is precisely because of this that he does not want to live long. As Gabamaru tells us about this, we see him recalling all the people he has killed, and without a doubt, it is a very powerful scene. Then, we see a woman talking to Gabamaru, who is now tied up and locked in a room. That is when the woman starts revealing some facts about Gabamaru. At that moment, we find out that Gabamaru is a ninja trained to kill and also hails from the village of Iwagakure. This village is no ordinary place because it trains the strongest ninjas in the world and is known for its brutal methods. The woman then comments that it makes sense for Gabamaru to have such an extraordinary body because he was trained like a demon in Iwagakure and probably passed all the tests there. The woman also mentions that people from that mysterious village are able to break swords with their bodies. Gabamaru then comments that those fools could not hurt him in the slightest and he says that he does not need to use martial arts to defeat his opponents. The woman is intrigued by this last part and asks if he can perform jutsu, to which Gabamaru replies that he can. As expected, the woman asks Gabamaru to show the jutsu, and he asks why. Fearlessly, the woman responds that she is very curious. However, Gabamaru refuses and says that if that is the reason, he will not show anything. After that, a round-faced man orders his subordinates to burn Gabamaru at the stake because Gabamaru has been sentenced to death for his countless crimes. Then, we see Japanese people with funny haircuts starting to pile up straw to light the fire. We then see Gabamaru tied to the stake, waiting for his fate, which we know is immortality because he is practically immune to anything. After that, we continue learning about capital punishment and I say this because the series narrates that in ancient Japan, those sentenced to death by burning were the ones who caused fires. The explanation does not stop there, as it is also explained that people who die by fire experience extreme pain from the burns on their skin. Their muscles contract so hard that it breaks their bones, and they eventually die more from the smoke than anything else, showing that this is a very cruel punishment. The Japanese people with funny haircuts finally finish piling the straw at the stake and light the fire. Gabamaru starts to burn, though as expected, this does not hurt him in the slightest as he opens his eyes in that state. And as expected, El Chongo felt pleased because he was talking about how none of his efforts had succeeded. In a scene change, we see Gabamaru bound again. He then says that he never intended to become immortal and adds that he wants to appear soon. After that, we see the woman from before turning her back and noting everything Gabamaru said. Then Gabamaru feels cold and asks the woman for clothes, adding that if she is going to turn her back, she should at least give him something to wear. 
However, the woman is not interested in moving and mentions that her position does not interfere with her work, which is to document Gabamaru's case. Gabamaru sighs and mentions that his story is not interesting. When the woman hears this, she simply replies that she has to do it. Then she starts asking some questions about Gabamaru's life. At that moment, Gabamaru recounts that he never knew his parents because his village chief killed them to adopt him. As Gabamaru tells this, we see a bloody scene where the person executes Gabamaru's parents in front of him when he was still a baby. After that, the woman asks if he has any dreams or goals, to which Gabamaru responds that he has none because he is a killer and does not need such things, he must focus on killing the people he is ordered to execute. In the middle of the story, we see a past scene where he holds a severed head in his hand as if it were something natural, which gives us an understanding that he is used to it. After all this, the woman asks one last thing that day and asks how he could be captured considering he is immortal. Gabamaru replies that he wanted to leave the village, but his comrades betrayed him, so they surrounded him to capture him. At that moment, Gabamaru mentions that in his village, leaving the village is forbidden, so he has no complaints about what happened. After hearing this, the woman asks why he left his village. However, unfortunately for us, the series shifts to another scene before we hear the explanation. After that, we see El Chongo looking crazy because he wants to try a way to finish off Gabamaru, this time by being killed by cows. If it is not clear what I am saying, I explain that the series tells that a person's legs are tied to two cows forced to move in opposite directions. The goal is for the person to be torn apart by the strength of these animals. However, that's not all we learn, we are also told that a person's extremities can withstand a weight of 500 kilograms, but the pushing force of a cow is 900 kilograms, so it's easy to conclude what will happen if executed this way. After that, El Chongo orders his funny-haired men to run the cows, but as expected, Gabamaru's extremities can withstand more than 900 kilograms, so the cows become exhausted and collapse. Gabamaru feels disappointed again, and El Chongo, with a round angry face, because his reputation as an executioner is ruined. He then orders to bring more cows to try again. On the other hand, the woman approached Gabamaru and said she found all this strange, to which Gabamaru responded by asking if she was referring to the body of a ninja. The woman replied no, she was referring to Gabamaru's contradictions. She pointed out that although he claimed he wanted to cease existing in this world, he resisted when the animals dragged something he found very strange, not to mention that he said he had tried to leave his village. This didn't make sense because if he had no will to live, why did he try to escape? That was what she wanted to understand. After saying all this, she asked him to answer the question she had asked yesterday, indicating that he had not answered before because he was trying to flee his village. However, Gavimaru's calm demeanor completely changed, showing the expression of a killer. Suddenly, someone appeared, I'm not sure who he was, but we will refer to him as such to simplify the story. Essentially, this person approached the woman and asked her to forget about the record because they needed to eliminate it as soon as possible. The woman firmly replied that she had to do her job. At the same time, we could see that one of the man's subordinates appeared and told him that he had already brought the ox, but the woman didn't care about that because all she wanted was to complete her report on Gabamaru's case. Thus, Gabamaru decided to answer her question, stating that it wasn't very important. He then explained that in the village of Guagara, he managed to rise to the highest hierarchy because he was the best assassin among them. Consequently, the village leader gave him his daughter's hand. However, the girl was entirely different from what he had imagined because, despite growing up in the land of assassins, she didn't know much about the world as she was very kind and religious. Eventually, he got used to living that way, and as a result, his abilities dulled, so he decided to abandon his role as a ninja to live with her. The village leader initially seemed reasonable and asked him to undertake one last mission, but as expected, it was all a trap, and many ninjas ended up capturing him. Gabamaru decided to surrender and let himself be caught. This led to his current state where he awaited his final fate, which seemed not to come because he was practically immortal. Later that night, the woman learned that Gabamaru was nicknamed Gabamaru the Hollow because he eliminated all his rivals with an expressionless face. But that wasn't the only thing, she also heard a story where Gabamaru defended himself against 20 ninjas and killed them all, which she found very contradictory since he claimed he wanted to die. The next day, Gabamaru was sentenced to death by boiling oil, but that also had no effect. When the man saw this, he was terrified and soiled his pants. But at that moment, the woman said that the time had come. Meanwhile, Gabamaru wondered why he resisted dying and said he was hollow and had nothing to lose. To end this game, he decided not to resist next time. But to his surprise, something different happened because the man ordered Gabamaru to be taken to the ritual chamber. When they arrived, he met the woman documenting his case, revealing that her name was Asiman Sajiri, a sword expert from the Asiman clan, known for their swordsmanship. 
Not only that, but Sajiri was also nicknamed the Executioner. After that, she tried to execute Gabamaru, and he quickly realized that the woman was genuinely trying to attack, but he decided to dodge. However, she still managed to slightly wound his neck. Thus, Gabamaru felt the fear of death. Next, he commented that he had taken note of his case to properly eliminate him and realized that Gabamaru had an abyss within himself. However, he was wrong in one thing, which was that Gabamaru did not want to lose his life and had been pretending to be resigned because his true desire was to live for his wife whom he loved. After that, we see a scene where he loves his wife deeply, and she feels the same for him. As usual, they both want to live peacefully without fearing that one of them might die. For this reason, Gabamaru told the village chief that he would leave his role as a ninja. Unfortunately, that person was trash. Initially, he accepted the request, but later he betrayed Gabamaru. Additionally, he also burned his daughter's face so that the men in the village would reject her. So, without a doubt, there was something evil in all of this. Back in the present, Gabamaru continues to evade Sajiri's attacks. However, in the end, he stops and shows an official document issued by the Shogun stating that if he cooperates with them, all charges against him will be dropped and his death sentence will be lifted. Moreover, he explains that due to the Shogun's rank, the village and Wakir would not be able to pursue him anymore. However, to obtain this protection, he must go to the paradise on Earth. Then, we learn that a place similar to Nirvana was recently discovered, and in that place, there is an elixir of life that grants immortality to anyone who drinks it. Due to this rumor, many soldiers were sent there, but they all returned transformed into flowers. For this reason, the Shogun decided to send criminals sentenced to death for a new expedition to Nirvana. After narrating this, Sajiri says that her task is to find the strongest criminal who wants to live. Upon learning this, Gabamaru accepts the offer because he wants to gain protection to reunite with his wife. However, the Shogun controlling the prison says he will not let him escape. At that moment, Gabamaru asks if he still wants to see ninjutsu, to which he replies yes. A few seconds later, Gabamaru performs fire ninjutsu and uses his power to eliminate all the guards opposing him. After that, he sets his goal to find the elixir of life so he can reunite with his wife, returning to his wife who is waiting for him at home. After that, we see Sajiri remembering the moment when she saw her father carrying out an execution. She was shocked at that time because the convict wanted to die while telling a funny anecdote. And after a few minutes, the executioner, who was Sajiri's father, beheaded him in such a way that the convict didn't even realize what was happening. In the end, the subject was able to finish his anecdote. Sajiri was impressed and tried to imitate her father's method, as the beheading was so precise that the convict felt nothing. When she reached the age where she could execute people, she did it very well. The series shows how she executed the beheading so impressively that the subject's body seemed to be made of butter. Due to her outstanding performance, she received praise from many people. However, Sajiri also felt fear and had disturbing visions of the people she executed, which continued to haunt her. We see that she feels the bodies of her victims trying to creep towards her, and as expected, she doesn't like it. In Sajiri's memory, we see a man with an eye patch and red hair approaching her to give some advice. The man commented that in Sajiri's executions, there was fear and doubt, so the convict ended up feeling pain because Sajiri's sword was not fully effective. When Sajiri heard that, she said she would try to fix it. Then we see her continuing to practice and beheading others, but she still feels scared and hesitant. Although her skills are above average compared to other executioners, she is still far from achieving the perfect beheading like her father. In the midst of practice, a red-haired man with an eye patch approached her and told her to look at the eyes of her sword. When Sajiri looked, she was shocked because she could see the expression of pain from the condemned. She once again had terrifying visions where the dead tried to catch her because they couldn't rest in peace due to their last painful memories of this world. She hoped the condemned wouldn't feel anything, neither suffering, hatred, nor anything similar, like unplugging a television that just turns off. Her executions were imperfect, causing the spirits of the victims to try to capture her. We see a powerful scene where she is naked, surrounded by the hands of the decapitated criminals. She continues with the executions, and we learn that until now, she hasn't been able to reach her father's level. In each execution, she has many doubts, and with every new victim, a new ghost joins the list of those chasing her. After all that, we see her placing something on Gabamaru's face and preparing to eliminate him, or so it seems. However, in the end, it doesn't happen because the object was used so that the criminals couldn't see the Shogun, as they had no right to see him. After that, we see the characters on a beach somewhere, where the Shogun's servants set up an open tent to gather the criminals. Sejiri and Gabamaru arrive at the tent where the criminals are gathered and are officially received by the Shogun and his guards. They are informed that they will have an audience with the ruler, but as mentioned earlier, their faces are covered so they can't see him. This angers the criminals, and they respond with fury. After that, Sajiri looks at some of their biographies and realizes that their crimes are so cowardly that she can't comprehend them. However, 
Her thoughts are interrupted when the main character complains about not being able to breathe and wants to see the ruler directly. Sajiri then tells him to be quiet, or the paper mask will be a small issue compared to other problems. Then, an officer with a loud voice reads out the secret orders that they must go to Nirvana and bring back the elixir of life, and in this way, they could gain official pardon and freedom. This excites the criminals, and one of them is so excited that he says he wants to gain pardon so he can go back to committing evil deeds. As expected, this person is very evil, and when Sajiri realizes his presence, she asks herself if in this situation she could eliminate him without hesitation and thus achieve her goal of performing the perfect cut. You know, it's something we all think about. Next, we see a woman named Yuzura behind the main character. At that moment, she recognizes him and mentions that he is quite well known in the underworld and has a reputation for being cold-blooded and fighting like a madman. However, Yuzura adds that the main character is shorter than people say, so she feels disappointed. In the middle of the conversation, Sajiri observes everything and asks if the main character is just like the other criminals or worse, adding that she had been watching Gabamaru closely, but since he agreed to join the search for the elixir of life, he hasn't shown any spirit or interest in anything. After that, he used his sword to investigate further and was disturbed by what he saw. Then, one of the second spokesmen described the island they had to go to, mentioning that it looked like paradise on earth. As expected, the group of people who heard the announcement immediately became doubtful and began to behave noisily, thinking that everything they were told was false. They were then ordered to remove the masks they were wearing and shown something shocking, a man sitting with flowers growing from his body. It was explained that this man was the sole survivor of a recent expedition in which 60 other people disappeared. As one might expect, people started whispering to each other because of how strange this situation was. The condemned prisoners began to feel anxious and fearful as they saw a corpse filled with flowers growing out of its body. Although now I think it's something that happens in real life when someone is buried, it's better to leave this gruesome topic behind. On the other hand, the fact is that seeing the collective dissatisfaction, the officials assured them that they did not need to worry and that the flowers they saw were a mystical blessing. However, the prisoners were enraged because they felt belittled. Then, one of the royal officials shouted while crying that they were condemned to death and should be grateful for dying in such a beautiful way. As expected, the criminals wanted nothing to do with the journey to Nirvana Island because the risk was too high and there was no guarantee they would return alive. Even though it was clear, the authorities hoped that the condemned would appreciate this unique opportunity and not waste it. However, the criminals seemed not very convinced by the official's speech and remained worried about the supernatural threats they might encounter on their journey. Some of them began to doubt the safety and authenticity of this mission, commenting that there was a high possibility that the elixir of life didn't even exist and that everyone who went would die in vain. At that moment, an official told them they could leave if they were not satisfied, but when one of the prisoners tried, he was killed by an executioner, specifically by a red-haired man with an eye patch from before. From his movements and manner of beheading, we could conclude that this man had the same level of skill as Sajiri's father. Returning to the speech, we see that one of the guards mentioned that these bandits would have a partner to work with, and those people were the executioners. Essentially, they would be divided into two-person teams. The criminals were then warned that they would be monitored and that the death penalty still applied on the island if they committed any crimes. They were also told that if that happened, the executioners would not hesitate and would immediately behead them. It was then that we could see that Sajiri was the partner assigned to Gabamaru, and we knew this because she placed her sword on his neck a few seconds later. The spokesman then mentioned that, if something happened to the criminal's partners, then the latter would be executed by a clan called the clan, which was a very powerful and fierce family. At that moment, we could see Gabamaru remaining calm, and when Sajiri saw him, she wondered whether he was brave or just didn't understand the seriousness of the situation. After that, the ruler called an official and whispered something in his ear before announcing that they would depart soon. After this, the official in charge suggested reducing the number of prisoners because there was a limit to the ship's capacity and the number of supervisors. Realizing what this meant, one of the prisoners killed another to demonstrate what the official meant. Then, the official confirmed that anyone who died would be useless, and thus the prisoners began killing each other. While the island's ruler watched the scene without understanding what was happening, he enjoyed the show because it was one of his goals. When the official commented on this, one of the officials thought to himself that it was all nonsense because they were all attacking each other and couldn't show their abilities, so the surviving criminals were the roughest and most foolish. Amidst all this, the ruler wanted to know who had the red seal, the most dangerous criminal. Then, the official mentioned that among the criminals, there was a group of people with extraordinary abilities who could be considered superhuman, including Gabamaru from Asia and the others. Then, at that moment, the man with the eye patch named Izan approached Sajiri and said that although there was a lot of violence in that place, the things they would face on the island would be far worse. He added that only those who were cursed would suffer because the executioners would also face great challenges. 
It was then that he commented that Sajiri was not suited to be an executioner, considering she hesitated when executing her victims. After saying that, he added that a woman who was the daughter of a famous samurai should live peacefully at home and not wield a sword. Okay, remember that this is based on feudal Japan, so don't try to criticize this anime for that. Then, the man with the eye patch said that Sajiri could not bear the guilt and souls of her victims. The woman felt frustrated by the comment, but she said that even at home, her family's reputation remained, as their livelihood came from the deaths of others as executioners. It was then that she remembered how in her youth she felt intimidated by her family's work and one day decided to take a knife and face reality. We then see a scene where she partially draws a katana, and in that way, she first encountered the karma of an executioner. After that, Sajiri told the man with the eye patch that despite facing difficulties, she wanted to be a warrior and was determined to do whatever it took. In the midst of this situation, the criminals realized that if things continued like this, they would all die, so they decided to unite and escape from the samurai guards. With this in mind, some criminals tried to attack Sajiri, thinking of her as a weak target. At that moment, Izan prepared to stop them, but Sajiri stepped forward and said she would handle everything. With that, she drew her sword and with a few precise moves managed to behead her opponents in seconds. However, she hesitated again and caused pain to her opponents, as seen when we saw the lifeless heads of the cursed ones. Okay, this part is quite terrifying. Because of this, Sajiri feels bad for not being able to remain calm during the execution. In the midst of this, the main character comments that no one can remain calm when taking another person's life, and at that moment he draws everyone's attention, including Sajiri, who is lost in her thoughts. However, Gabamaru's voice brings her back to reality. Next, we see how the main character manages to approach the Shogun without anyone noticing. As expected, the guards panic because they did not anticipate this. Nevertheless, instead of causing a massacre, he suggests finding a less brutal way to choose the travelers who will go to Nirvana, adding that if they continue like this, there will be no one left. However, Everyone disagrees because they all want to continue watching the show. After that, one of the guards tells one of the criminals to kill the main character, promising a direct ticket if successful. As expected, Tipo prepares to fight Gabamaru, which of course surprises Gabamaru, who mentions that he doesn't want to kill anyone. However, seeing that his opponent does not retreat, Gabamaru regrets and says he doesn't want to carry another soul's burden on his sword, but if there is no other choice, he must execute his enemy. Back to the fight, Gabamaru is taken aback by his own peaceful demeanor, unconsciously allowing Gabamaru to approach him. Moments later, Gabamaru makes a swift move, slits his opponent's throat, then beheads him, all while his hands are tied. Next, the criminals attack Gabamaru, but he defends himself very effectively. When I say very effectively, I mean he breaks several necks, spines, and backs. But the latter is yet to be confirmed. After a very animated display of violence, we see Gabamaru covered in his opponent's blood, and everyone is shocked by the scene. As one might imagine, the only word that comes to their minds to define Gabamaru is that he is a monster. However, Gabamaru turns around, draws his sword, and realizes that his victim's souls are far more numerous than his own. He then mentions that they cannot even imagine the suffering Gabamaru endures after killing his opponents in such a brutal and cruel manner. Gabamaru then comments that he is ready to face the consequences and karma of his actions, so he is not afraid to execute his opponents when necessary. Amidst all this, Sajiri has a revelation after witnessing Gabamaru's battle. She realizes that she doesn't need to eliminate her fear of beheading but must accept the emotions and karma that come with the action, just as Gabamaru does. After that, the officials announce who will be part of the Nirvana expedition, and among them is Gabamaru. However, he is not alone, as Yuzuhira, Tamiya Gantetsusai, Nurugai, and several others are also on the list. They also mention individuals like Majima Rokuroda, Chobaza, and Nurugai, who are also chosen for this mission. In total, there are 10 people, and each will be overseen by an executioner. Later, we see Gabamaru on a ship, and after traveling, he finally arrives at the island of Nirvana. When he sees the place, he is stunned by the aura it emanates. While Gabamaru arrives at the mysterious island, he recalls a leader who showed immortality. Clan members attack him with many weapons, causing many deadly wounds, but the person keeps a terrifying smile. According to rumors, this is due to the medicine they obtained from the land across the sea. So, we can assume that the person drank the elixir of life. Gabamaru told this to his companion, but soon realized that Sajiri was skeptical. He then said that he initially thought it was impossible too, but eventually found that it was true. He mentioned that he was unsure if they could find the substance to become immortal because its location was a mystery. As they walked through the dense area, examining their surroundings, Sajiri commented on how impressive it all was. In fact, she thought the place was so impressive that she began to think about the elixir of life that might be there. 
But Gavimaru stopped and expressed the opposite opinion, indicating that the place was actually quite frightening and affirming, do you know the dangers we will face? Then, Gavimaru removed his armor, and Sajiri was shocked and said that he shouldn't do that. Gavimaru replied that walking in an unknown place with his hands tied was madness, but Sajiri didn't care about his opinion because it was an instruction from the Shogun. Her duty was to watch over Gavimaru and not allow any rule breaking. After that, Sajiri provided new ropes so Gavimaru could tie his hands himself, and at that moment, Gavimaru began to speak. One, the odds were stacked against them, and he told his companion that they only had enough food and water for three days, and the only clue they had was a random picture. After that, Gavimaru began to doubt whether the Shogun truly wanted to find the elixir, which made Sajiri tired of Gavimaru's complaints. Sajiri quickly drew her sword to Gavimaru's neck and said that she was an executioner, not a companion, and told him that if he disobeyed orders, she would behead him. When Gavimaru heard that, he resigned himself and followed Sajiri's instructions while tying his own hands. While doing so, he reminded himself that he was doing all this to return to his wife, so he was willing to accept and fulfill the conditions. Suddenly, a large hammer struck Gabamaru's face and threw him into the air. After that, Kiyom, who had thrown the hammer, picked up a metal ball and mocked Gabamaru for being off guard. Despite the surprise, Gabamaru was still alive after taking the hit. Then, Sajiri checked on Gabamaru and told him that his neck was only dislocated. From there, we learned that Kiyom was a warrior monk obsessed with weapons, which led him to hunt hundreds of warriors to steal their deadly weapons. After that incident, Gabamaru noticed that Kiyom's hands were not tied. Sajiri then asked her superior why the prisoner was not tied up. Quicho commented that they could tie his hands on the way back and didn't want to waste time arguing with the prisoner about it. When Gabamaru heard that, he tried to follow along. Then Quicho began to state that Sajiri was an executioner of the lowest rank because she was honest, but Sajiri cut off Quicho's explanation. After that, the giant of a man angrily slammed one of his weapons down because Gabamaru did not recognize him. He showed a box full of weapons and said he was excited to try them out. Gabamaru complained that he had met someone with a fetish for weapons and said that there was no point in fighting and giving the advantage to others. However, Kiem commented that it was better to finish off the criminals first before searching for the elixir. At the same time, we saw the executioner Quicho waiting for the outcome of the fight, and Gabamaru was upset because he had to kill someone again. His wife did not like him doing that, but despite this, he remained resolute and ready to act. The battle was raging when Kevin ran toward Gabamaru while Sajiri touched his shoulder, insisting that he tie his hands for the fight. Although the first attack from the giant weapon-wielding enemy hit its mark, the weapon shattered upon impact. However, he quickly sprang into action with another weapon, which also broke when it struck Gavimaru. Despite this, Gavimaru remained standing and counterattacked with his ball and chain, but this weapon too broke. Finally, the villain lunged with a spear, though this also had little effect. At that moment, Gavimaru had already tied his hands but still managed to catch the attack, using the weapon's pull as leverage to throw the villain into the air. Afterward, the weapon fell while Gavimaru landed on the ground. Following this, Gavimaru kicked one of the spears, hitting the monk and causing him to fall. Afterward, Gavimaru complained about the difficulty of fighting with his hands tied, surprising Sajiri, who was impressed that everything could be resolved with a single blow. However, everyone was shocked when the villain stood up laughing, revealing that his armor was directly connected to his skin, and his mask fell, exposing his evil nature. At the end of the battle, we see that Gavimaru caused chaos and brutally killed the giant weapon wielder. On the other hand, we see that Gavimaru was still tied up without a scratch. Afterward, Gavimaru approached Sajiri and suggested that they start looking for the elixir to make up for lost time, which she viewed with disbelief but she showed her hands to prove they were still tied and then tried to draw Gavimaru's attention by unsheathing her sword. However, instead of fighting, he took the prisoner's head to prove he was already dead, then bid farewell and returned to the ship, adding that he could finally go home and take a hot bath. Later, we see Gavimaru commenting that he expected a fight, but Kishio reminded him that they were neither enemies nor allies, just doing their job by taking the villain's head. After that, he told his colleague, the executioner, to be careful on the way back because many had been lost. The executioner said he didn't need to worry about himself, adding that the person truly in danger was Gavimaru because he had to watch over him, and mentioned that compared to him, he felt lucky to be able to go home. After that, Kishio remarked that many things would happen, some would form alliances while others would try to seduce their executioners, and some had already started killing. This was proven when a giant villain killed someone in the forest, before leaving, Kishio predicted that the situation would change within a few hours and more than half of the villains would die, adding that most of the villains there could be replaced, so it wouldn't be surprising if the shogunate contacted Gavimaru's clan for more warriors. 
He also informed Sajiri about the rumor that the performance of the people on this mission would determine the next executioner's leader. After conveying all this information, he left with a warning not to let her guard down in the presence of all the villains. Then, he saw Gabamaru and reminded himself that he was dangerous despite them traveling without incident in recent days. As he sank into his thoughts, he suddenly snapped back to reality when he realized that Gabamaru was attacking him, and he barely managed to block the attack in time. He then asked why. He was doing something, and with a cold look in his eyes, he confessed that he wished he could end his life painlessly. Meanwhile, Sajiri stared sharply into his eyes, thinking that she had finally found his true nature. After that, he recalled the day when his parents decided to leave the village, adding that at that time the village leader said that emotions make a person weak, and unless one is strong, he cannot protect anything, let alone valuable things. With that thought, Gabamaru charged at Sajiri and she said that it was against the rules to attack her. In that situation, he revealed that everything was about priorities and his goal was to find the elixir before the people from his village came and ruined everything. At that moment, he mentioned that he would not be an obstacle to achieving his goal. After that, Gabamaru continued his attack and Sajiri saw his extreme and abnormal sense of reason and morality. She believed that the ninja should be executed immediately, but somehow she hesitated without knowing why. Then we see that Gabamaru also faced the same dilemma and knew that he should have killed her at that moment, but he also hesitated. As expected, the boy did not understand why, because his most important goal was to reconnect with his wife. At that moment, Gabamaru remembered that in the past his wife had said that it was natural not to want to kill people. She said that he should eliminate his own emotions because they were a void. When he heard that, he lovingly mocked her, saying that she couldn't call herself that when she blushed with just a little kiss. Next, she said that it was important to be true to his own feelings, so if he made a decision based on that, she would follow him no matter what. At that moment, Gabamaru remembered that his wife reminded him that he had feelings and emotions. After all that, we return to the present and see that the current fight continues and Gabamaru did not manage to end it when he had the chance. He realized that his abilities had returned and knew that it would not help him survive this ordeal. Therefore, he recalled the village leader's words that helped him become cold and broke Sajiri's sword to deliver a fatal blow, but she blocked it with her sheath. At that moment, Gabamaru confessed that he didn't care about the fate of the other criminals, but killing her would also hurt him. So, he asked her to let him end his life peacefully. However, Sajiri was skeptical that he still had emotions. Then we see that he struggled to end his life and the dark apparition of the village leader urged him to be ruthless. However, in the end, the essence or thought or mystical apparition or whatever of his wife appeared, and Gabamaru forgot his horrifying thoughts and stopped before finishing off Sajiri. In that instance, he admitted that deep down, Gabamaru was just a product of his environment, and because of that, he hesitated to attack. Shortly after, Gabamaru began to cry, calling himself weak for not being able to kill Sajiri. But she said that it was not weakness, but the beginning of strength. He then said that avoiding emotions is like turning away, and he knows this because it was he who indirectly taught him to face his demons. As she rose, Sajiri told Gabamaru that she would overlook his crimes and challenge him to face his wrongdoings and emotions to reclaim his life. She added that she wanted to be by his side to see if it was possible for someone like him to have such a life. She said that although their relationship had not changed, Gabamaru was no longer the same, and on the other hand, Fuchai was surprised to see the statues created on the island, which indicated that long ago, there was a civilization in that place. While looking on in awe and confusion, he also approached one of the butterflies to examine it, and one of them bit him. When that happened, he immediately had a vision of what could happen if he let the poison flow through his body. With that in mind, the swordsman cut off his hand without hesitation and destroyed the creature. Shortly after, they both witnessed flowers starting to grow, and more strange creatures appeared, including a giant with eyes on its hands. However, back with the main team, Gabamaru and Sajiri faced a fish-headed creature, and without hesitation, our Gabamaru put on his mask and prepared to fight. After that, we saw a scene from the past when Fuchai arrived on the island on a raft. They talked about their lives, and shortly after, they entered the forest, and after walking a bit, they encountered giant insects and even larger animals. However, back in the present, Gabamaru and Sajiri found many large animals, and she was frightened, unlike Gabamaru, who immediately used his firepower to defeat some of the monsters. Amidst the chaos, Sajiri was exposed to one of the creatures, and still in shock, she couldn't react. Even so, Gabamaru managed to save her. After that, Yuzuhira and her partner arrived to help, and when the battle ended, Jusio said it was impressive to see Gabamaru defeat so many monsters alone. After discussing many things about the insects and creatures on the island, Gabamaru formed an alliance with them. Amidst all this, Sajiri realized she hadn't made any progress since arriving on the island, and due to the stress of the situation, she fainted. 
Meanwhile, elsewhere, Toma and Chob, two brothers, arrived on the island to seek the elixir of life. At the same time, we learned about their past and discovered that Toma had managed to join the Sassiman clan and become an executioner, which allowed him to accompany Cho. As the two walked on the island, they encountered various animals, but fortunately, they worked together to get past them. Back with the main group, Gabamaru decided to carry Sajiri in his arms to prevent her from getting hurt. Not long after, Sajiri woke up, and when she left the cave where she had been, she found Gabamaru preparing food for everyone. Then, the characters started talking about the island, and Gabamaru mentioned that while looking for food supplies, he found very interesting things and thus explained that all the flowers and vegetation in that place grew from human bodies. However, he mentioned that the ingredients he used for the food were ordinary plants. After that, the characters continued to theorize about the creatures, suggesting that they might be demigods who had come into contact with supernatural substances that caused their transformations. Later in the afternoon, Samurai Genji met with her and told her that she had to leave because she was not qualified to be on the island. He then suggested that she should try to restore her role as a woman in the clan and have children to ensure the lineage. In the midst of this situation, it seemed, and he commented, that it would be best for her to stay because for some reason, Gabamaru sympathized with her. If violence broke out or he lost control, Sejiri could come or defeat him. Meanwhile, elsewhere, we meet Tenza and Narugai, who still haven't disembarked on the mysterious island. Suddenly, tentacled creatures attack them, and in the midst of this, Narugai felt that he should perish there as punishment for inadvertently causing the death of his comrades. However, Tenza made him reflect and rush to protect his companion, and after a tense moment, they both found a raft and reached the shore of the island. After that, they both dried off and cleaned themselves, and this way, Tenza was shocked to discover that Narugai was a girl. A few minutes later, she said that she was interested in him and asked him to propose to her when they got off the island. This way, they both planned to obtain the elixir of immortality so they could return and live peacefully. That night, Sajiri and Gabamaru had a deep conversation where they talked about what it means to know oneself and how difficult everything is. As a result, the next day, she gave an answer to Genji and said that she would stay because she wanted to become better, which was, of course, not well received by Genji and he decided to attack her. However, suddenly a large man severely injured Genji and we could see that it was the same man who killed his executioner shortly after they arrived on the island. Then we saw a flashback where we learned that the large man was born as a big child who, from an early age, had the power to take lives, and his name was Rokuroda. Back in the present, the giant took part of Genji's body and threw it. After that, he tried to hurt Sajiri, but Gabamaru intervened and kicked the enemy's face hard. Meanwhile, Sajiri ran to tend to her injured comrade, whose body was partially destroyed. At the same time, Gabamaru faced Rokuroda. They both fought, and Gabamaru realized that his opponent's body was very strong and durable. Meanwhile, Sajiri did everything she could to stop Genji's bleeding, but he said it was useless because his wounds were too severe. Then, the warrior told his comrade that she could follow the path she desired and that she had the courage of a man as well as the sensitivity of a woman, and that made her strong. After that, she joined the fight against the giant and supported Gabamaru in the duel. This way, Sajiri managed to cut off the enemy's finger. However, the situation quickly became complicated again because she couldn't cut through her opponent's skin. Then, Gabamaru and his allies tried to hurt the giant, but it was fuel. In the midst of this, the monster captured Gabamaru and slammed him to the ground. Fortunately, he managed to get back up, but the damage was so great that his body began to bleed. At that moment, the giant attacked again, and Sajiri tried to protect her comrade at that critical moment. Gabamaru managed to use pure wit, and with this, he delivered a very precise blow that was able to divert the beast's powerful attack. After that, Gabamaru stood up and, together with Sajiri, they planned a combined attack to end the battle. Gabamaru then used his fire power and launched many hot projectiles towards his enemy. Although none of the attacks succeeded, he achieved his goal by setting the surrounding trees on fire, causing the beast to start running out of air due to the smoke. As the creature fell to its knees on the ground, Gabamaru took advantage of it to finish it off. At that moment, he managed to calm all his emotions and beheaded his opponent calmly, allowing Rokuroda to die peacefully. After that, the two of them fled from the fire while looking into the distance at the already dead Genji, whose empty body would soon be consumed by the flames. Soon after, we saw how the beasts, also called demigods of the island, appeared and approached the fire, showing that they had primitive minds. After that, Sajiri and Gabamaru met with Yuzuhira and Senta, who were witnessing something horrific that we couldn't see. At the same time, elsewhere, Toma talked about how strange the island was, because instead of hosting gods or divine beings, the island was inhabited by terrifying monsters. Not long after, we saw that they encountered two slender women kissing, and when they saw humans, they went crazy. Then one of the women commented that it was rare for humans to reach that place, so she invited them to a party. However, 
Her friend got angry and said no because it was disgusting, as they were mere humans. After that, we saw that the woman transformed into a man and prepared to fight with Toma. At the same time, the main group found a village and soon met a hooded girl who was chased by Gavamaru to ask her some questions, but the girl quickly fled. Thus, the chase began and in the midst of it, a creature made of trees appeared to protect the little girl. Without hesitation, the main group decided to have some fun, and Yuzuhira confronted the monster while Gabamaru and Sajiri chased the little girl. Finally, Gabamaru and his allies managed to capture the little girl, but quickly realized that she was not an ordinary child because she possessed great power. However, Gabamaru managed to subdue her using large vines found around. In the midst of this, the girl began to cry, so Sajiri asked Gabamaru to release her. After that, we saw how she took care of the little girl with great affection and hugged her. After that, they met with Yuzuhira and Senta, who had managed to subdue the monster and suddenly the tree creature spoke and asked them to release the girl in exchange for a lot of food. Yuzuhira quickly said that they already had enough supplies and were not interested. When the creature heard this, it doubled the offer and offered a hot spring bath so they could rest. When Yuzuhira heard this, she immediately agreed, and the group was forced to follow. Shortly after that, in the creature's village, they explained that they had been living with the little girl in the village for over a thousand years. After that, they showed where the bathroom was, and the first to use it were Yuzuhira and Sajiri. And then the mysterious creature explained some things to the characters and began saying that the elixir of life is real and that the island is named Kotaku, inhabited by supernatural and immortal beings. Furthermore, it explained that the elixir they are seeking is called Tam, and that the place is divided into three parts. The first is the coastal area called Asham, the second is the central part called Ojo, and the last is the oral area where Tan is located. However, the monster explained that if they continue searching for the substance, they will soon encounter the Tensing, who are perfect and immortal beings tasked with eliminating intruders on the island. Meanwhile, elsewhere, we see that Shoa and Toa are doing everything they can to fight the person they encountered earlier. Unfortunately, that person is a Su Tensin, making him immortal and thus easily defeating them. After that, he throws them into a well on the island that transforms them into flowers, and in this way, they are used as the base for creating the elixir of life. However, fortunately, both Toa and Shoa survive despite being injured from the Great Fall and quickly prepare to get out of the hole. But back to the main group, the tree man tells them everything that was previously explained and also says that people who turn into flowers are used as the base for Tan. After that, he tells them all this is a sign of mercy because when they meet Tenson, they will surely die. And after that, the creature introduces itself as Oko and says that the little girl's name is Mai. Next, Gabamaru decides to take a hot bath, so Sajiri follows to ensure he doesn't do anything wrong. When the two reach their destination, they meet Mai, who is also about to bathe, and she is surprised to see them. However, Gabamaru doesn't mind much as he is used to bathing with others since his village has public baths. After that, we see that Sajiri realizes that neither Gabamaru nor the little girl knows how to wash properly, so she decides to help them to truly relax. While she scrubs them, Gabamaru remembers that his wife once did the same and recalls that she said he must truly rest from time to time, otherwise he wouldn't have the energy to face important battles. After the bath, Gabamaru realizes he can rest but quickly focuses on the next goal to see his wife sooner. Then, we see a scene from the past and get to know Tenza's life before he became an Aseman. He was a child treated like trash by the people in his village. We then see him sitting near a tree while people pass by, hurling harsh words at him. Tenza recounts that his family was poor and his parents had no desire to raise a child, so he had to fend for himself. Thus, it is revealed that he lived as a small-time criminal for most of his life. When he was hungry, he would simply steal or take food from others, and that was his life for some time. He soon concluded that this was the right way to live because he felt very free. However, one day he encountered some swordsmen who wanted to fight, so Tenza fought them and, to everyone's surprise, he managed to defeat them, leaving them terrified. They begged for forgiveness from the boy, but then Tenza realized his strength and wanted to continue punishing his victims. However, he was stopped by someone from the Seaman clan. Then, we see Narugai and Tenza walking on the beach with the goal of finding a way out. But after walking for quite a while, they realized they were lost. Narugai said that if they walked aimlessly, they would not achieve anything. Tenza then commented that if they went into the forest, they would be in danger. He also mentioned that previously he wouldn't have cared, but now that he knew Narugai was a woman, he wanted to avoid danger. When Narugai heard this, she blushed and said that they should hurry so she could marry him. Tenza responded that it was too soon in many ways and mentioned that if they wanted to do that, at least they should get out of that mysterious place. However, Narugai seemed not to hear those words and continued to praise Tenza's manly attitude. Suddenly, they both felt a presence beside them and when they turned, they realized that someone had appeared out of nowhere in the sea. That was when we met Tensensai, who appeared there because he sensed many disturbances in the area. 
He immediately said that he had found many corpses of creatures called Zachin and, since he could not find the culprit, he asked Tenza if it was his doing. Tenza quickly realized that the person had an evil aura and his suspicion was confirmed when the individual changed from a man to a woman in an instant. Without hesitation, Tenza and Narugai decided to flee into the forest on the island. However, Tenzin Sang said it was futile and soon appeared in front of them and attacked, sending them flying. After that, he tried to do the same to Narugai, but she managed to dodge the enemy's attack. Tenza was surprised and said that Narugai moved very well even though she was only human. Narugai approached her friend to help him. The creature then said that he would finish them off because he didn't like disturbances on the island. As he was about to attack, Tenza moved ahead and cut both of his eyes with his sword. The creature praised Tenza's speed despite being human. Tenza felt scared because his cut had no effect. He immediately retreated and told Narugai to be on guard. After explaining a brief plan to escape, Tenza cut the enemy again and felt proud of his speed. Both of them ran towards the forest, but Tenza quickly caught up with them, reminding them that running away was futile. Just as the creature was about to lose control, Tenza's teacher, Sion, appeared and used his sword to take down the enemy. The three of them managed to escape successfully. As they avoided plants and various obstacles, Narugai wondered how Sion could run at that speed despite his damaged and almost blind eyes. Tenza explained that Sion was a master, and even though he was blind, he could sense his surroundings through his hearing and smell. Once the situation calmed down, the three stopped, and Tenza formally introduced his teacher, saying that he had taught him everything he knew about swordsmanship and concluded the introduction by stating that his teacher was an extraordinary warrior. When Tenza finished his story, Sion scolded Tenza for not cutting down the enemy properly and said that he needed to concentrate more next time. At that moment, Tenza mentioned that his teacher acted like that even when they were on a dangerous island being chased. Afterward, he commented that he had already completed his task on the island and wanted to go home. With that thought in mind, he looked for his bag to leave but soon realized that there was no current to take him off the island. Worse, he felt the presence of dangerous creatures, so he decided to look for his friends to find a way out and fight whatever they had to face. When Tenza heard all that, he was excited because that was what he and Narugai were doing. They quickly proposed finding a way out together. However, Sion said that they first needed to eliminate the girl because she was a criminal and might cause problems. After saying that, he commented that the executioners had a duty to eliminate criminals who caused trouble or tried to disrupt order. He also revealed that the criminal assigned to him tried to seduce him, so he had to eliminate her, and therefore, they had to deal with Narugai. Tenza then said that he wanted to help the girl. After a brief discussion where Tenza gave good arguments, Sion decided to let the girl join them. At that moment, he remembered that from the beginning, Tenza never cared about anyone, but now he was starting to care, which made him happy to see his student growing as a person. After that, Narugai thanked him and called him teacher, but he said that he wasn't allowed to call him that yet because he hadn't taught him anything. Later, the characters discussed how to defeat or escape from Sijin. Suddenly, Tenza appeared to fight. Sion, without hesitation, pulled his allies and ran, but a few seconds later, Tenza commented that running was useless because the creature would find them. After saying that, he drew his sword and prepared to strike the enemy. However, this time Tenza avoided the attack and said that he had gotten used to Tenza's speed. Nevertheless, Tenza used a special technique and attacked again, but the result was the same. A few seconds later, the creature counterattacked and injured Tenza with its supernatural power, causing a fatal wound. After that, there's a flashback scene where Tenza asks his brother why he was chosen as a student. The warrior replies that he saw potential in Tenza and wanted to help him become a swordsman. The two then continue their training, but Tenza is frustrated because he can't land a single blow and his swordsmanship skills are nil. It's then that Shin notices his students' emotions and says that if he continues to train with discipline, his potential will develop. However, Tenza doesn't believe he has those qualities because people in his village always told him he was worthless. He then says he wants to leave, isn't interested in living a disciplined life, and wants to live as he pleases. The warrior responds that it's fine and Tenza can leave, but on the condition that he lands one blow. Since then, a few days pass, but Tenza is tired of the challenge and decides to leave on his own. However, he is soon stopped by Aizen, who asks if he has managed to land a blow on Chen. Tenza replies that it's nonsense and that he will leave anyway. Instead of stopping him, Aizen says he can go, but first, he must escort him to a place, and the young man agrees. Shortly after, the two arrive at a cemetery where they find the grave of Xian's former student. At that moment, he realizes that in the past, the student wasn't fully committed to learning like he is now. As a result, after some time, the young man left the dojo and, when he returned, had become a bandit. He had the misfortune of being the one tasked with ending his life. Furthermore, he realizes that the young man's last words were an apology to Xian, and as usual, it left a mark on the swordsman who since then promised to fully commit to teaching. 
Aizen then tells Tenza that if he leaves, he will likely suffer the same fate as that young man, and Shin doesn't want that to happen. After that, Aizen tells Tenza that if he wants to leave, he should at least land one blow on his teacher. At that moment, Tenza remembers Xian's words and decides to put his all into his training. Thus, we see how the young man trains hard and takes the training seriously. While training, he wonders when the time will come when he has something he truly wants to protect. In a scene transition, we return to the present and see that Tenza is injured. He realizes that Narugai and his teacher are in great danger, so he immediately gets up from the ground and attacks his opponent repeatedly. At that moment, he realizes that his only goal is to protect his allies, even if it means sacrificing his life. Thus, Tenza fights valiantly against Shijin. On the other hand, Xian tries to help him, but his student forbids him and asks him to leave with Narugai. Realizing the danger the warrior is in, Xian decides to follow his request. Tenza fights to the end, and after some time, Shijin manages to kill the young man. Shijin comments on how strong Tenza was, while Narugai cries and screams at Xian for not helping his friend. Xian replies that the creature was far stronger than them, so at that moment, they couldn't do anything. However, he promises to avenge Tenza's death in the future. Finally, we see a flashback where Tenza, after a difficult process, successfully disarms his master. Because of this, he asks Xian to continue teaching him. Xian smiles and agrees. After that, we return to the present, and with deep sadness, we see Tenza's lifeless body. On the other hand, we see Senda experiencing conflict due to the confusion from the information obtained at Oko's house. So, Sajiri suggests that he rest, as it is clear he is experiencing information overload. As expected, he takes her advice. After bathing, we see Senta sleeping in front of Gabamaru, while Gabamaru keeps watch all night. At that moment, Gabamaru takes the opportunity to go to the Ore area. At that moment, he recalls Senta's earlier warning that it was unwise to enter that territory without a solid plan, but he wants to check it out for himself. In the same way, however, Gabamaru felt that he couldn't afford to waste any more time, so he moved forward. As he advanced through the thick fog leading to Aeroi, he encountered the shadows of trees resembling Oko. He then realized that these creatures were singing strange songs and, as expected, he was curious about them. Nevertheless, Gabamaru continued his journey, unaware that Milo was following him. Shortly afterward, he reached the doors and prepared to enter. However, he stopped when he noticed the presence of Tenzin, who had previously killed Tenza. As expected, Gabamaru did not know this, so he only suspected that the mysterious woman was not human and asked her to identify herself. Tenzin was angry at Gabamaru's sudden appearance and told him to leave because she didn't want to deal with another human. Before receiving an answer, Gabamaru realized that Tenzin had the ability to transform someone into the elixir of life, so Gabamaru became immediately cautious. Realizing this, the supernatural being became aggressive, and the two began to fight. At that moment, Tenzin was shocked when her arm broke during the battle. Before she could say anything, Gabamaru attacked her and kicked her neck until it broke. However, both wounds healed instantly and the monster tried to attack him, destroying the floor in the process. As expected, Gabamaru observed the regenerative ability and immense power of his opponent that destroyed the floor. Thus, he concluded that it was one of the Tenson, so Gabamaru used his fire technique to burn Tenson and turned his attention to the door to continue his journey. However, at that moment, he was attacked by the charred creature, which slammed him into the door's wall. After that, Tenson now took the form of a man and believed he had accidentally killed Gabamaru, whom he considered a valuable material for more elixir. However, he was shocked to see that Gabamaru was still standing. Then, the albino asked if he was one of the Tenson he had heard of, and without receiving an answer, Gabamaru continued to fight the creature. Meanwhile, the monster was curious to know how Gabamaru could withstand his attack. However, Gabamaru did not reveal anything and demanded that he disclose the location of the elixir of life. Of course, Tenson said nothing. As the fight continued, Gabamaru realized that the blows were very powerful. Furthermore, Gabamaru realized that exchanging blows with Tenson would be dangerous because of his extraordinary strength and immunity to attacks. Because of this, Gabamaru noticed that the kick he delivered had a unique and effective impact in making Tenson bleed, which made him wonder how that could happen. However, before reaching a conclusion, Tenson transformed into the form of a woman and then decided to use her power to attack Gabamaru with invisible attacks originating from her hands, causing significant damage to the shinobi. Nevertheless, Gabamaru still tried to withstand the attack. While withstanding the attack, Gabamaru wondered if he could emerge victorious from the battle. Then, he saw an image of his wife in his mind, which gave him the strength to push through his opponent's fire and approach Tenson. 
After that, he mentioned that his goal was to return home no matter what he had to sacrifice. After the previous incident, Gabamaru attacked Tensei with a speed that surpassed their regenerative abilities. This way, Gabamaru managed to prevent his enemy from recovering, leaving them sprawled on the ground with severe injuries. Afterward, Gabamaru demanded Tensei to reveal the elixir's location, but Tensei only laughed as flowers began to sprout from his body. Before passing out, the monster said he would be scolded again, and after saying that, many flowers emerged from within him. In the presence of Tensei's transformation into a flower monster, Gabamaru tried to stay silent to analyze and combat the monster before him. However, the transformed Tensei released a beam that exerted great pressure on Gabamaru's body, preventing him from using his fire power and evading the monster's attacks. As his consciousness began to fade, Gabamaru wondered if the events they were experiencing on the island were real or just a nightmare. After that, Gabamaru woke up to find himself in bed with his worried wife after he had a very bad dream. At that moment, a tear fell from Gabamaru's eye, believing that it was all just a dream. His wife offered chrysanthemum tea to help calm him, and then he smiled, realizing that everything was just an illusion. Nonetheless, he was grateful to see his wife, even if only in a dream. Then, he apologized for not being able to return to her in the real world. Back in the present, Gabamaru was being strangled by the transformed Tensei, but at that moment, Gabamaru reflexively attacked, following the instructions of his former leader who trained him to hurt his enemies until their last breath. Albino then activated a power called Higoshi and managed to burn the flower monster's tentacles that were holding him. However, he was severely injured and could not get up from the ground. At that moment, Gabamaru saw Amy by his side, and with her power, the girl helped Gabamaru escape from Sujin by creating a crater that carried them to a valley far from the battlefield. After Tensei's transformation disappeared, he asked Main why he did what he did. Back in the village, Senta apologized to Sahir for letting Gabamaru go and accepted the consequences. He explained that he had tried to find Gabamaru alone but couldn't navigate through the thick fog, which led Oko to explain that it was impossible for two residents to travel outside the area where they were. For her part, Sajiri suggested that their next step was to search for Gabamaru if he was heading to Orai. However, Yuzuhara said that Albino might decide to continue the journey alone. After that, the female ninja pointed out that an Asio Mana should be concerned about the well-being of the criminal assigned to him, which left Saw speechless. On the other hand, the tree monster realized that Main had also left, so he decided to help them go to Lorai because he believed the girl was following Gabamaru. After learning that Oko could navigate through the fog, Yuzuhara changed her mind and told Sajiri that she was willing to accompany her in the search for Albino. While traveling, the woman realized the great challenge they would face after reaching Orai, which was confronting Tensei. The passage describes various events and characters on the island. It is explained that Tensin consists of seven sages separated from a single senate after mastering mystical arts. The tree man also tells about the transformation his people experienced more than a thousand years ago, where everyone turned into trees. Because of this, they gathered in the Ojo zone, hoping that their souls would enter the Orai. Remember that Orai and Ojo are two of the three zones on the island. However, in the case of the tree man, he mentions his daughter, who he believes was the first to undergo this transformation. Meanwhile, in the Orai zone, we see members of the Tensin group debating which form they prefer, female or male. They argue and discuss calmly. Just as they are about to reach a conclusion, Funk and Hody appears and says they need to talk about the intruders on the island. He states that the current humans are an unusual group compared to those they have interacted with in the past. He mentions reaching this conclusion after finding many bodies of creatures called Shing on the island. After that, Zhu Fa reprimands Su Him for being careless and letting the humans he encountered escape, even losing to them. As punishment, Tenson decides to temporarily strip Shin of his youth with an invisible force from his palm. Seconds later, we see Toma and Chobai warning Zhu Fa to be careful with his actions because they are a family that must stay united. Finally, Zhu Fa complies and decides to calm down, then reports about the humans he sent to Pazat. However, Fui and Yodai, their master, warns not to underestimate humans or individuals fighting against Chuhan, as their abilities might allow them to escape from Pazat. After that, the master concludes that other humans might also be difficult to deal with. He then asks Chuhan if he managed to kill the human he fought, and Chuhan says yes. Despite complications, Toma and Chobai remain confident and state that they can handle any challenges that come their way. They then serve a cup of tan to each group member, toasting to immortality and their master. Shin then regains his youth after drinking the elixir and, as expected, is now angry. Meanwhile, in the rocky valley, we see Gabi Maru regain consciousness and reflect on the monster he fought earlier, thinking he might have a chance to defeat them and fight alongside his allies. After that, he turns and sees the criminal Tamiya and his executioner Fuchai. Then the big man mentions that Gabamaru is done and asks if it's time for the albino's end. 
Immediately, the three characters prepare to fight and Gabamaru has to face the warriors. Again, Tamiya questions if Gabamaru will die because of his bloody appearance. After a while, the two criminals decide to test their strength if they fight, but Fuchai stops them, saying what they are doing is senseless and unscientific. He then suggests Tamiya gather information about Gabamaru without killing him. On the other hand, Gabamaru realizes that the two warriors before him are very strong, so he changes tactics and asks for an alliance. However, Tamiya draws his sword to ensure Gabamaru is not trying to deceive him and expresses his disappointment at what seems to be cowardice. Fuchai then asks Albina why he made the request, and both are surprised to learn about the existence of creatures called Tensin. As expected, Fuchai doubted whether they should trust him, so they decided to meet the creatures mentioned by Gabamaru. After that, the blonde executioner mentioned that Gabamaru was a competitor in the mission but was curious about the strange creatures on the island. He claimed that he didn't care about the pardon for his crimes and only wanted to become immortal, recording history as a legendary warrior. He wanted to defeat those superhuman creatures to achieve this. Although he considered Tamiya Fuchai's idealism as foolish, he was also interested in meeting the immortal creatures because he wanted the chance to dissect them. Now, their goals aligned, Gabamaru, Tamiya, and Fuchai officially formed an alliance. To start, Fuchai suggested that Gabamaru provide more information, and he prepared to talk about Mei. In the midst of this, Gabamaru was surprised to see Mei slightly bigger and hear her mention his name, which excited him. He asked if she knew the secret of the Tensei and if there was a way to defeat them all. Then, Mei told Gabamaru that the power to defeat those creatures was called Tao, but she could only give a brief explanation about it. Even so, she said that Tao was strong, weak, body, and Tandian. At that moment, both Tamiya and Fuchai recognized the word Tandian and explained that it was the area below the navel. However, before she could continue her explanation, the group was attacked. So, Tamiya attacked and thought that the best way to understand Tao was by fighting the monsters in front of him. After that, a big man carried Mei on his shoulders to guide her. As the creatures approached, Gabamaru saw from a distance a monster different from Shujin and wondered what that creature was. In a change of scene, we see Sajiri's group. As they walked, Center reached a conclusion based on the information provided by Oko. He commented that perhaps the island should not be mistaken for a true paradise on Earth, because based on what they had seen so far, the place was just a random mix of religions and cultures created by humans. He also theorized that the island's rulers wanted only humans who turned into flowers to return to the continent, which could be a clue to finding the elixir and escaping the island. After that, Senta stopped when he realized he had spoken too far, but Sajiri and the others praised him for his knowledge. After listening to Senta's theory, the ninja woman wondered if they could face the Tensin enemies since they had been there for over a thousand years and worried that Gabamaru and Mei were already dead. However, Sajiri said that the albino was still alive because his sole purpose was to return and meet his wife, and he would not die before achieving that. Soon after, Oko explained to the others about the power called Tao, which is an energy present in all things in the world. He explained that the Tensin had control over this power. Oko said that mastering Tao could grant powers similar to those of a god, and it could only be extracted through the yin-yang cycle. This could allow someone to have superhuman strength or survive normally fatal injuries. In a change of scene, we see Narugai trying to suddenly attack Shin with his sword, but Shin easily intercepted him, which was surprising because he was blind. After that, the samurai told him that he would not train him to use his sword yet, despite his desire for revenge on Tenza. Then Narugai begged Shin to teach him how to fight because he did not want to see the people important to him die. Upon hearing that, the warrior told him about his ability to sense waves around him, which allowed him to distinguish objects clearly even though he was blind. He also explained that his spirit had to be balanced to sense those waves, having both anger and calmness simultaneously. Even though Narugai knew that this ability couldn't be acquired directly, he still insisted that Shin teach him how to use a sword. Thus, the warrior pointed out the mistakes he noticed in Narugai's technique and demonstrated the correct way to use a sword. As Shin continued explaining, he cut Shajin, who approached, into several pieces. Then he told Narugai that he wouldn't be his teacher but that he could observe him while fighting and learn on his own. This led Narugai to join the fight, and at the same time, we could see Shin telling himself that he needed to perfect his ability if he hoped to stand a chance against Tenson. In a scene change, we could see all the Tenson engaging in intimacy with each other, and afterward, Rafnatansi asked Mutin if it was possible for the human he defeated earlier to escape from the pit. Mutin replied that it was possible because they were too weak to try getting out of the pit's depths, and also explained that the human assimilation ability would only hinder their escape. Nevertheless, the criminal Chobai managed to escape from the pit while carrying Toma on his back. Once safe, Chobai told Toma about his plan to take revenge on Tenson, and Toma reluctantly agreed to accompany him despite the task practically endangering his own life. 
However, Chobai believed that Tenson's weakness was in the lower part of their body because that was where he saw them regenerate when he cut his opponent's body at that time. Hearing this, Toma was impressed with how Chobai could deduce this detail, adding that his brother might be a genius in defying death. At that moment, they were both attacked by a monster named Dachai, sent by Tenson to investigate the humans on the island. Then Dachai asked them to return to the pit and become Tim. As expected, they refused and decided to bring Toma and Chobai before the head of Tenson. Hearing this, they were forced to defend themselves and called forth a creature named Yashin. While Toma fought against Shajin, Chobai fought against Dachai. During the fight, the strange creature underestimated the blonde criminal because he believed he couldn't control Tao. After a brief clash, he saw an opportunity to fatally wound the bird by striking its neck, which he eventually achieved. As usual, this caused Toma to panic, seeing his brother lying on the ground and bleeding. However, the blonde got up from the ground and continued fighting. That was when the creature became frightened because his opponent was recovering quickly despite being human. Upon closer look, he realized that his power was increasing exponentially. This way, the second round began, and during the fight, Shove concluded several things about Tao until he realized that it could defeat Tenzin. Despite hearing this, he felt fearful because Tenzin's power could be affected. So, he decided to eliminate Shuv. During the fight, the boy remembered his past, where he had to slice his own face to become a criminal because his appearance didn't fit the underworld. In this way, he could protect his brother's integrity. Afterward, the blonde boy attacked the monster and injured it in the stomach, adding that it might be the creature's weak point. Realizing he was in danger, the creature became serious and ordered his allies to attack the human warriors. However, when he turned around, he saw that Toma had defeated the rest of his subordinates, which clearly surprised him. Unfortunately for him, Yo had learned how to use Tao and could also see that mystical energy. With that knowledge, Yo eliminated the opponent in front of him, ending the fight. At the same time, elsewhere, we see a large ninja fighting while asking Mei if he was using Tao correctly. Mei commented that he needed to combine strength and weakness to achieve perfect balance, but in that place, he was only combining strength with strength. The battle continued until our hero eliminated several of Shujin's monsters. However, the captain of the monster group recognized Mei and said he hadn't seen her for centuries since she disappeared in Tenzin's palace. Having found her, they planned to take her back to that place. Hearing this, Gabamaru thought the pink-haired girl was the same as the creature. However, realizing that she didn't want to go with them, Gabamaru decided to fight to protect her. At that moment, Tenzin's servant split himself in two and prepared to fight the protagonist. At the same time, the great criminal and Gabamaru's ally also wanted to join the fight. But before that, the creatures said they were the two training to master Tao, adding that there were five ways to train to master this difficulty. The first four ways could be done alone, while the last one required a training partner. After that explanation, they mentioned that they needed intimacy with someone of the opposite sex to complete their training and master the mystical power. They then mentioned that Mei was a tension, but because she was born with incomplete power, she was expelled by the leader and given two choices, die or start over on the path of Tao and become the training partner of the two of them. In this way, she was marked and had to flee to avoid that fate. Hearing this, everyone understood what it meant and prepared to fight. At the same time, Gabamaru remembered his wife, who was also marked. The two Yoshi then merged and transformed into a monster, saying that the moment of truth had arrived. During the fight, Mei explained that Gabamaru had to combine strength and weakness to merge with Tao. In the end, Gabamaru managed to do so, and when seeing Albino's aura, the pink-haired girl commented that he had a lot of energy. After that, he used his fire power and severely injured the monster. At that moment, the creatures realized that this person could master Tao. Before receiving the fatal blow, they recognized that Gabamaru was similar to Tenzin's leader. Gabamaru eliminates these monsters and says that they are now ready to face the immortals. After the battle, Yoshi reveals that the leader of Tenzin ordered them to monitor the intruders on the island to determine if they posed a threat, adding that in the end, they were right. After saying this, both Gabamaru and the major villain eliminate them. Then, Gabamaru mentions that he discovered a trick with Tao but assumes that with a little practice, he will be able to master it. Meanwhile, elsewhere, we see Sahira and her group arrive at the Tenzin temple, where they encounter an immortal monster with a cunning face who beheads Joko. Seeing this, everyone is shocked, and when the ninja woman realizes the danger, she tries to escape but is soon captured by the enemy. She stands by, trying to analyze the situation, and at that moment, Joko explains that this creature is named Mutin and that he is one of the Tenzin at the temple. When the fat man hears this, he is surprised, while the monster smiles because it has been a thousand years since the last human came to that place. Next, Tenzin provokes Opko to transform into a tree, making him happy because his religion and purpose in life are fulfilled. 
However, Mudin destroys this illusion, mentioning that everything about humans turning into trees and the religion is a lie created by them. In reality, the Hoko village is nothing more than a human laboratory to uncover the mysteries of biological life, which naturally disappoints the tree man. At that moment, humans modified by Hoko appear as his warriors. They subdue the ninja woman and threaten the others. While Tenzin stands over one of them, he answers a crucial question for our hero, and in this way, Mutin reveals that the elixir of life does not exist, adding that Tan is something only they need. If a human drinks it, they will turn into a tree like Hoko, rendering the quest meaningless. Then, Yuzuhara rises from the ground and brutally attacks Mutin, grabbing Sahiri's hand and escaping. At that moment, the samurai woman doesn't understand what is happening until her companion shares his life philosophy, which is to survive by any means to help his comrades. Of course, this wouldn't be possible if he were dead. However, Tenzin quickly recovers, captures his prey, and praises the ninja woman. He offers to teach her how to use Tao, adding that if she succeeds, she will have great power under her control, but if she fails, she will become raw material to make more tan. At this moment, the fat man appears in their path, ready to fight everyone, including Sahiri and the others. Thus begins a fierce battle in which the fat man manages to cut the enemy while the ninja woman uses her strength and skills to do the same. However, Tenzin mentions that these techniques are examples of how Tao can be used but notes that they are too weak to cause damage. The difference between humans and gods is vast, and thus the duel continues, with him demonstrating his superior power. However, he tells Sahiri that Tenzin's weak point is in the abdomen because Tao emanates from there. The samurai woman manages to strike him in that area, but he mocks her because they do not care for their bodies. However, at that moment, the woman severely injures him with an upward slash, and the sudden blow forces him to retreat. As he observed his opponent, he realized that the woman could use a significant amount of mystical power at any given moment, something considered very dangerous. After that, everyone noticed that Sahiri had injured Tenzin to the point where he couldn't move, and the female samurai stated that if the energy protecting him was Tao, she knew how to hurt him because Gabi Maru emitted the same aura. This made the monster think that the energy Sahire could use was poison, something he found both intriguing and dangerous because he feared for his life but also wanted to see what kind of tan he could create with it if he defeated her. The fight continued, and he decided to eliminate Sajiri, considering her the most lethal. However, the team managed to survive the enemy's initial attack. After that, the enemy transformed into a woman and attacked from above with spit bombs, which our hero successfully avoided. Seeing the fierce battle, Sajiri was momentarily speechless, but the female ninja quickly brought her back to reality, saying that it wasn't a god and could be defeated. After that, Yusuri accelerated Tenzin's technique, discovering that it was very similar to hers and thus claiming she could match it. Yusuria then used one of her techniques, capturing the enemy and bringing it down. This signaled her partner to do his part, and realizing the deadly danger, the enemy tried to defend himself, but Senda appeared behind him and restrained him with determination. Thus, Sajiri had the opportunity to wound the monster in its abdomen and succeeded, causing the enemy to fall. After the fight, the characters took a short break, during which Sahira asked Senta why he helped, with Izuhara questioning if he felt something for her. He replied that he only admired her for her freedom and life. He added that he wanted to be an artist, but because of his family's rules, he had to train under the teachings of the Seaman clan like his ancestors. In a change of scene, we see Gabamaru's group defeating all the creatures, and the albino approached me to try to learn more about Tao and everything that was coming. However, his body seemed to lack the same energy. He collapsed, and as a result, Gabamaru started bleeding and fell to the ground, shocking his companions. Almost simultaneously, near Tenzin's temple, we see that Sajiri and Tenza were distracted because Sabiera called them and said that Mudanza's body had turned into flowers. Before he could react, the enemy attacked him, but fortunately, Senta deflected it and took the wound for him. Consequently, his body became infected, and flowers began to grow from him. With no time to think of anything else, Sahira realized that Tenzin had turned into a monster, and they had to fight him once again, who now seemed more dangerous. However, at that moment, they moved in to confront him, starting a fierce duel, and thus the anime ended.